गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन आई श्रुति त्रिपाठी होल हार्टेडली वेलकम यू ऑल ऑन दिस कंक्लूडिंग डे ऑफ फाइव डे नेशनल लेवल एफ डी पी ऑन अर्थक्वेक सेफ डिजाइन एंड कंस्ट्रक्शन प्रैक्टिस वी ऑल हैव लर्न अलॉट फ्रॉम ऑल द टेक्निकल सेशन फ्रॉम ऑनरेबल डिग्निटीज एंड ऑल्सो एंजॉय द नॉन टेक्ट सेशन पास्ट फ्यू पास्ट फोर डेज सो लेट्स कंटिन्यू दिस जर्नी ऑफ लर्निंग फ्रॉम अवर वेरी फर्स्ट सेशन ऑफ टूडे ऑन अर्थक्वेक एंड ट्रेडिशनल हाउसिंग सिस्टम इट्स माई ऑनर टू इंट्रोड्यूस यू ऑल the eminent speaker of this session mr rajendra desai sir sir has completed his btech in civil engineering from iit bombay in 1970 later he got his ms in structures from rajgarh university usa after working in the usa for 12 years he returned to india in 1985 with his architect wife rupal to focus on the software technologies for shelters water sanitation and energy which are more sustainable and viable in the indian context for next 8 years he worked with different ngos on these issues getting exposed to the grassroots conditions in this field in the country a damage assessment assignment for government of india in the aftermath of 1993 latur earthquake in central india took him into this field of disaster risk mitigation which soon became his principal field of work he along with his wife devoted much effort in the performance improvement of the buildings made with vernacular building system that predominantly depends upon the local materials and skills through the input of modern engineering and to some extent the modern materials in the past two and half decades he has worked on disaster risk reduction of building especially houses in many parts of the country including latur jabalpur kutch uttarakhand himachal pradesh delhi etc as well as in nepal Uh, as a part of these efforts he has been involved in the post disaster shelter rehabilitation programs disaster risk reduction technologies demonstration projects aimed at housing as well as public building training of construction personnel including engineers masons etc as well as making of iec materials such building technologies manual manuals brochures etc et for agencies like UNDP India UNDP Nepal UNESCO BMTPC Gujarat State Disaster Management Authority Bihar SDMA and many more His work jointly with his wife has brought him a number of honors including the Hudko Harihum Ashram Award in 1995 first AS Arya Award of IIT Roorkee in 1998 distinguished alumnus honor from IIT Mumbai in recognition of his work of the grassroots in 2010 hudko design awards in 2013 2014 2015 and 2016 and jamnalal bajaj award 2018 for science and technology in rural development along with all the, along with these technicalities he sir has, sir's passion also include love for mountains trekking traveling and music he has extensively traveled through the americas from arctic circle all the way down to terra del fuego and antarctica <laughs> Sir has also traveled in West Africa, including hitchhiking north south across the Sahara. It's my honor to invite Honorable Joint Director, National Center for People's Action in Disaster Preparedness, Engineer Rajendra Desai, sir, for this session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Right. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, it is indeed, uh, uh, sir. 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 Yeah. Sir. Sorry. Uh, sir, uh, before you start, I, I want to say one thing uh, uh, sir, sir. to all the participants. Uh, um, uh, Ra Rajendra Desai sir is is not uh, known as a single person. Always his wife Raj uh, <laughs> uh, is always be there. So oh. as far as if you look at the email ID, also it is a Raj. Uh, so that is the email ID, common email ID they have. And um, as and when we are conducting any program. uh um uh, madam and sir both both are coming together so uh, uh, rajendra this is a engineer and uh, uh, the madam is uh, architect so it's a wonderful combination also and uh, i think they have they have done extensive work as uh, shruti has said and uh, so uh, sir uh, i think you have done a remarkable job as far as uh, rural housing is concerned and traditional housing systems in india is concerned uh sir please it's over to you sir all right uh now thank you very much sangvi sahib for this uh kind of flattering <laughs> remarks uh 
Uh, no, in the end, it's really a pleasure to be on this platform and uh, talking to so many uh, professionals and I guess academicians. Uh, and uh, you know, especially uh, since Latour earthquake, we got into this uh, vernacular buildings. You know, we didn't really know much about them. We knew about mud architecture and all those things, but it was really Latour intervention that really got us fascinated about what people can do without engineers and architects. And so that was 25, 26 years ago. And you know, since then, we had opportunities uh, to work in different areas. And I think this is what basically I want to share. And also I want to talk about the, the wrong impressions that the engineers carry about these buildings. And uh, you know, I'm sure my next, you know, next presentation by Vivek Ravel and Kiran Bai also will talk about rural housing. So, there may be some overlap here and there, but uh, let's, uh, okay, let's begin. Uh, so basically I'm gonna be talking as you know about earthquakes and traditional building systems. Now, what is traditional building systems? You know, it's uh, essentially, you know, what's called vernacular architecture, vernacular buildings. And, you know, these are the buildings built by people without architects and engineers using age old proven building technology. You know, it is not just some mumbo jumbo, you know, created by people, but there is a lot of logic and a lot of proven history. So uh, uh, basically, you know, these vernacular buildings, they form an important part of the culture of an area as much as language, food and dress. And they also give a local identity, very, very important part, uh, integral part of all this. So, uh, sorry, why is this not moving? One minute. Mm. Wait a minute. Let me, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, let me just restart this thing here. Why it got stuck? Why oh, I don't see this icon here. All right. Okay, sorry about that. Technologies. All right. Uh, <clears throat> let's let's move forward. So even uh, let, let's look at very quickly some vernacular buildings in different parts of the country. Uh, earthquake or no earthquake, uh, Uttarakhand, of course, typically has stone buildings, there are mountains. Nothing but stones, you know, and of course the forest. So there is timber, there is stone, and a little bit of earth so is predominantly stone. And we go to northeast, you know, there's with this ample biomass, bamboo, timber, variety of reeds, and and you get, you know, Arunachal, of course, is rich with vernacular systems. Each tribe has its own system, and then you go further, kind of a uh, little bit south from Arunachal into Meghalaya. And you have this timber and bamboo system. You know, each one has its own peculiarities and very much related to the local things. And of course, in Kutch, uh, you know, there is a lot of stone and there is a lot of earth. So you have architecture which is combined with stone and earth. And, uh, and I mean, overwhelming majority of buildings fall in this category. You know, vernacular buildings. Uh, and unlike, unlike, you know, I mean, we engineers think that. We are these sort of designers and builders, but that is really not true. And also interestingly, in a lot of these areas, even the lifeline buildings have been made with this kind of technologies because they are endemic to the area. And a little bit about North Gujarat, where with a semi-arid, you have also earthen architecture, just straight mud or earth. And going back up in the Himalayas, in Spiti, and of course, Sada, and Lahul and all these areas which are, uh, you know, in the rain shadow area, they get a lot of snow, but not much rain. And, uh, you know, they are all earthen buildings because there's a lot of earth. And then, uh, you know, I mean, going to Kashmir, Kashmir has different zones, like, like all the states. And Kashmir is parts, you know, you are in the hills where there is a lot of rock and there is a lot of woods, trees. So, you have houses made of timber and stone or just just stone. 
and then you come in the valley of kashmir you know kashmir ghati what we call and there is fantastic soil to make bricks so you have brick masonry fantastic brick masonry you have you know and also let's look at some international stuff you know because a lot of us with a lot of money we go to see you know we go to england and we look at the british tudor houses which are basically timber laced brick masonry just absolutely gorgeous looking buildings and up in northern italy you know which is uh, part of alps and you have stone once again so you have random rubble masonry just like we have in our mountains and in southern germany which is also abutting alps there's a lot of timber so you have timber buildings and of course uh, in switzerland uh, basically a lot of stone and then look at look at this this building and look at this house which has stone roof you know it looks more like slate or flat stone and this could be anywhere in himachal or uttarakhand you know there was a time when we were, we had a we had a presentation in uttarakhand and i was showing them these houses and they were saying which part of uttarakhand they are from so but these are world famous architecture you know, and and people spend so much of money to go and see that and of course we have another very interesting example of uh, architecture from new mexico state of southwest united states uh, there is architecture of pueblo indians you know these are the natives of america of that region <coughs> and what you see here is the uh, is the traditional american indian settlement you know it's a multi story you can see three levels all of mud and timber and this has become so popular in that region that expensive mud homes are made using that architecture a lot of them may be mud houses a lot of them may be make believe mud houses and believe it or not you know we visited this area back in 1983 ah, i mean what how many years ago almost nearly 40 years ago and even then uh, we visited one house which was a million dollar house made of mud you know and very interestingly you have this four star hotel in this town called taos uh, which is a very popular tourist attraction and you have this four star hotel which is imitation pueblo architecture i mean can you imagine things like that happening in this country so it's it's a different world and people appreciate these things there <clears throat> now we need to look at some of the facts of vernacular buildings number one is i mentioned that part of rich cultural heritage that provide unique identity to every region you know in a small state like gujarat it's a tiny state and you have oh sorry come on sorry yeah uh, <coughs> small state like gujarat has so many different uh, traditional architecture you go to downs which is hilly and a lot of biomass you have one type and you come in the you know in the coastal area of south gujarat you have something else and then you as you move up uh, it, it changes and of course in saurashtra it's different and kutch it's different so you know this is this is something very very unique and it's very rich and interestingly in europe and latin american countries you know these these traditions are still very much alive and people take pride in them you know you go to england any one the smallest of the town will have buildings and houses which could be easily 200 to 300 years old and people take pride in possessing them and living in them and and this is not in only non urban areas this also in urban area and also we need to understand that they produce long lasting building that are often known to last for a century or longer and this is very much unlike our modern technology buildings whether we like it or not we have to accept this fact because we see this all around us and these are most viable in rural and semi urban areas you know which are not densely populated that easy to build you know these are very very simple technologies and that made with local materials i'll not say locally available okay today locally available even cement and steel is locally available so these are local endemic materials okay and local skills and they are most economical in the respective areas and that as a result they are accessible to local population even the poorest person would have access to these kind of buildings 
and these are executed by local artisans you know who know their area best you don't have outsiders coming and doing things and then you know it, it results into a lot of problems later on and when we talk about earthquake you know one must understand that more forgiving you make mistakes and still you must survive all right all right there are a lot of myths there are a lot of false understandings about this you know with, with our civil engineering education you know which starts and ends with cement and steel you know that biased mindset all right you know i mean i i i, I completed my iit education 50 years ago and that's what i learned cement and steel you know we were not even talk about talk about bricks all right and i don't think things have changed even today all right and this ultimately creates our mindsets when we come out of our colleges you know about the vernacular and traditional building system what is it number one you know we feel that they are outdated and they have no role in modern india they are not just trash them all right number two they are not scientific and hence they are not worth considering for use and hence not worthy of research you know tell me how much research gets done in this iits and nits and all other big engineering colleges how much research gets done really very little if any right <clears throat> unfortunately that consider a sign of backwardness poverty and shame all right and we give it a name called jopri huh? all right that's called hat or chopri i mean that means something that's bad something something you want to disown all right um, <clears throat> and i call it kacha all right and hence unreliable and safe it's very very interesting you know that if it's kacha then unreliable and safe that's what our engineering mindset tells us and so engineers are ignorant about the subject and hence have abandoned their systems in all their use now what has also happened in last i'll say maybe 26 28 30 odd years you know poor performance in the recent disasters of these vernacular buildings has strengthened the mindset of the engineers and as a result the people now let's look at some very very quickly performance in recent disasters you know there's 1991 uh, uttarkashi earthquake very quickly 93 latur earthquake and basically stone houses this is what happened i mean these houses simply disintegrate and in a very small area of 20 km by 20 km just think of how how big that area is 400 square kilometers something like 9 and 1500 people had died and few years later 1999 chamoli earthquake again you know these are stone houses and uh, houses performed pretty badly in a small area in between i missed 1997 jabalpur earthquake you know which were essentially brick houses and mud houses very small earthquake of very low magnitude and still uh, kind of intensive damage in several villages all right uh, more recent 2001 kutch earthquake and once again the vernacular systems primarily primarily of stone and of course earth and some places bricks and uh, this buildings did quite badly and then 2005 the kashmir earthquake and again brick and stone houses and and this is the kind of thing happened the kashmir earthquake of the epicenter was in muzaffarabad and as a result uh the the damage and the destruction and the deaths were in a far larger magnitude in the pakistan side uh but still did a lot of damage and this does not mean that particular buildings you know which are or the what we call people made building have to be so vulnerable and weak now let's understand a little bit about you know these buildings the building systems first and foremost these systems can bring safety against disasters like what we engineers think if they are built as per the age old traditions that proven performance all right what we have been seeing is far from that you know i mean i've been involved in the damage assessments in latur earthquake and uh, something like five six disasters we have done damage assessment quite detailed at point zero and the you know the first thing that comes out is that there is dilution in technology mm-hmm. there are missing elements typically bands and whatever i mean there is acute dilution 
which has happened in last 30, 40 years for a variety of reasons. And this makes these buildings vulnerable. Of course, there is deterioration quality also due to degradation of our artisans. You know, gone are the times when Mason's son was Mason and Carpenter's son was Carpenter. You know, the last 50 years after India became independence, things have changed dramatically. And for a variety of reasons, this tradition is, has broken down. And as a result, new people have entered, resulting into degradation of their skills and knowledge. And what they built, lack of maintenance. You know, we are our society, we are not known to be great at maintenance. We all know it. We can see these things all around. And, you know, so older buildings, obviously, you know, I mean, uh, when we talk of vernacular buildings, you have buildings which are 50, 60, 100 years old. And obviously the age, you know, in that age you pay price in the disasters. Um, as population is increasing, you are building in wrong sites. And uh, a lot of these are vulnerable sites. Obviously, the buildings suffer and people lose their lives. So let us see some great examples of disaster resistant vernacular buildings. In disaster from regions. All right, let's start with Himachal Pradesh, which is uh, obviously in the northern Himalayan belt, <clears throat> which is you know zone four and five of uh, seismic zonation. And what we have there, the traditional buildings are the timber lace renderable masonry, which supports the timber roof and the timber floors and the slate roof. Now here is a classic example. You know these are this probably. 50 or 60 year old house, which has light uh, timber living quarter at the top. And this is a fairly new building on the right. And you see multiple bands, you know, so you have in a, a, a you know, course of, you know, I mean, the random rubble and then comes a timber band. And again, random rubble and timber band. And, you know, you see the difference, one in the upper, in the upper right hand corner and the lower left hand corner. The lower left-hand corner doesn't look that new, or maybe it's a poor man's structure, but still you find multiple bands in that. And uh, another one more example, and you know, a lot of these are roadside, or you know, a lot of them are inside the uh, forest. And needless to say, you find multiple bands coming to Uttarakhand. Once again, you have timber lace masonry with random rubble. And uh, you know you have, but you have this heavy, heavy uh, stone roof. This is not slate; it's called patal. I mean, these units are like about two inches thick. They they weigh a lot, and of course, they're fantastically insulating. And you have intermediate uh, levels of uh, timber floor. So once again, <clears throat> you know these are uh, light timber uh, living quarters. You know these houses also must be 100, 200 years old. Uh, but provide excellent examples. Here's one more example with multiple timber bands. And there is another example, very vertical elements of timber. Mm -hmm. So talk of engineering, all right? And these are so well connected, okay? I mean, you look at, you look at this, uh, let me see, get my cursor. You know, here is the through and through timber element, which, which anchors this vertical reinforcement. Uh, here is on the left hand picture again, you see this timber elements which are through and through. And so they provide fantastic bonding with the with the with the random rubble. And then this brings ductility. I mean, modern engineers we talk of ductility, but it was already there in the traditional system. And here is probably, I think India is probably the best example of earthquake resistant building, uh, what is called the Koti Banal architecture of Uttarakhand. This is a six story building, believe it or not. Of course, stories are not that high. You know, each story may be six feet high. And I've had the for good fortune of going up all the way to the top story. All right, this is at least 200 years old, and which means it has seen, it has seen so many earthquakes. And you see this timber element uh, in the lower right hand picture. You can see my, uh, you know, this thing uh, here. and. Uh, this is like one whole tree. Of course, this is not viable today. But what we need to do is understand to appreciate and respect this architecture. 
All right. Now, <clears throat> look at look at Kashmir. The Valley of Kashmir also is some fantastic example. Uh, on the left, you know, this picture you see thick brick masonry piers. You know, like after every window, you have a masonry pier which is about two foot thick, and it's all in mud, mud, mud mortar. Inside, you have walls which are solid, which are essentially sheer walls, and then in between, in the you know, at the floor level, you have this double layer of timber providing fantastic timber diaphragm, all right? This is called a tak system. Tak actually means window in the Kashmiri language. And you know, by modern principles of, you know, of earth, earthquake engineering, we will say, oh, it's too many openings and this building is one, but hell no. I mean, this building could be easily 100 years old, all right? And mud, mud, mud mortar, hmm? kacha building, we call, all right? Let's, let's look at the thing on the right. Uh, this is, I would say, probably a legacy of the British, the timber laced brick masonry. But now this has also become very much nitty. And in the in the Valley of Kashmir, whether it is Srinagar or Anandnag or Baramula, all these big towns, you see multi-story buildings with this, all right? And, and I mean, there's a clear cut stress path, you know, in the well design. Uh, these kind of dhaji diwaris building system. And, you know, interestingly, uh, you know, you also find combinations that you have a six-story building of this traditional thing and where the lower stories will be made with ta, which are heavy. And then as you go up, you have you have dhaji diwari and then at the top, you may have a timber floor, all right, timber story. And here is a fantastic building. Again, I had a good fortune to get into this house 80 year old, of course, this, is, this picture was shot 10 years back. So it's 90 years old now, a type structure. And typically, you know, Kashmiris have parties in their houses. So the top story is without columns in the middle, without walls in the middle, imagine. I mean, this is, this is vulnerable by any of our modern engineering systems and still they've survived multiple earthquakes. All right, let's, let's move. Let's look at the Northeast Arunachal. And what you have is either timber houses or bamboo frame houses. This particular thing on the left side, you see this from the Bombila area. This is in fact in Bombila town. And this is timber. You have this solid timber column and your timber, you know, timber beams. And all these are, are, are this wooden two inch thick timber panels, you know, all tongue and groove system, just beautiful. No earthquake can destroy this. So this, again, could be easily 100, 150 years old. And then, of course, you also have bamboo and timber, uh, kind of a bit lighter structure, which are very, very ductile. And you have bracings in, in every way you can think of, all right? And, of course, see, these pictures of mine were shot back in 1993. We were doing a study in Uttara, I mean, in, in Arunachal and Mizoram. So those days... <clears throat> they have this, uh, they had uh, thatch roofs, you know, which would last for many years. And look at, look at the lower left hand picture. You know, these are big houses and Arunachali is like 100 individuals would be dancing inside. So that floor can take dynamic forces of people dancing. And that's why you see these bracings in every consumable direction. And say so is one more example. You know, so... So you have these things, you know, I mean, what better engineering you can think of. And after that study, you know, we had made these drawings and look at this marvel of traditional engineering. You have bracings in the walls, in cable walls, long walls, your bracings in the in-plane bracings under the roofs, all right? And your bracings under the floor. Okay, there are a lot of locations which are, which have strong winds, they may be along a ridge, so they're very strong again, wind loads, and of course, earthquakes always there. And what was interesting, this is back in 93, there was absolutely nothing non-local, nothing, all right? You found bamboo used in variety of ways, all right? I mean, <laughs> I could make just a presentation, one hour presentation only on these hubs, okay? But the thing is that there was nothing. Of course, recently, 10 years back when I visited, you have now, now in you know, um, an RCC post below, and you have CGI sheet, you know, for their of course own inherent advantages. 
and of course complications. All right. Uh, looking at some Meghalaya and Mizoram, once again, north, you know, northeast, and you have tim you know, ductile timber or bamboo frame, and you have these panels which are made of bamboo mat or you know uh, or uh, the other thing called ilkra, which are flexible. Uh, and uh, say in recent times, of course, new things have started to come in, but again, you find most of them two stories high. And uh, you know now, as you see in the lower picture, in the lighting picture, you see this RCC posts have come in, and in the upper right hand picture, you see this uh, concrete blocks, probably masonry. So, and of course, the tin roof. Good old days, tin roof was not there; they attached. You know. So, uh, all right, okay, yeah. Now, looking at some photographs of Meghala in that same area. And uh, you have this very, very elegant heritage buildings. This is a four-star or five-star hotel in Shillong. We had good fortune to spend a couple of nights in this building. And here's a cathedral from Shillong. You know, both are what you call the Assam style building system. You know, very much earthquake resistant. And you can see, you know, the the, the load path for the electrical loads. So you know, these are uh, uh, the traditional buildings, and these are all modern facilities. See, we have, we in India, we have this mindset, you know, that traditional buildings cannot have modern facilities, you know, which is the most screwed up mindset, all right? I mean, you go to Europe and you find a 200 year old house, and inside they're all modern facilities. So you don't have to demolish this fantastic, you know, buildings to to make to have the advantages of modern facilities. All right, all right. Uh, let's look at some common people's houses. These are in Mizoram. Uh, this is actually a farmhouse. All right, away from the town. Uh, this is right along the road next to the fields. Now this is like an eight foot by ten foot house, but it's most amazing. I mean, again, I, I can make a presentation on this house. The inside was amazingly compact and, and had all the facilities that an individual would need. But look at the bracing systems in both the directions. All right. And here's another house. It has modern materials. The panels are, I think, like more like bison panels. And you can see CDI sheets, the bottom skirting, you can call. So it's it's kind of safe against kicks and you know, abuse. And of course, CDI roof. Look at look at the, the bracings in the base, and this had actually a cable going around the house, and which was anchored by the roadside. So, I mean, people have understanding, okay, that what kind of forces can come on these houses. Here is another very large structure. Uh, this may be a chicken hen where they, you know, where they can rear the chicken for selling, but. Look at the bracing system there. And interestingly, I mean, look at the timber joints. Just using modern GI wire, they are strengthen the timber joints. I mean, these are very, very simple way to strengthen the joinery and to make the structure stronger and more earthquake resistant. Now, look, let's look at some Sikkim houses. Again, a mixture of traditional and modern. You see the RC posts in this house at the bottom. But otherwise, everything at the top, except for the CGI, is the traditional. And this is again Assam style. What's called this is Ikra. Uh, Ikra is a cane, and an Ikra or bamboo mats are infill. And uh, you know, this is plastered with. It used to be plastered with mud mixed with lime, and now, of course, also cement plaster is done. And uh, here is a little more modern uh, northeast house. You know, with the panels again within the timber frame, but I think these are maybe cement sheet panels. So obviously, modern things come and things are going to change. So it's it's a mix of uh, cement and traditional system. All right. So new new materials come, and of course, they may have their advantage, they may have their disadvantages. All right. But what is interesting is this: that in two thousand. East Nepal earthquake, or what we probably call as a Sikkim earthquake. Uh, there was very little destruction in this traditional building, and as a result, the death count 
something like 80 people. All right. Now, interestingly, what happened to the modern buildings? All right. Sorry. Again, still, this is a look at the traditional system, the damage. Now, the, here was the dislodging of Ikra panel. Okay. There may be deterioration of the infant or there may be, you know, some bit of uh, shaking and the panel came out from the group, the Tangan group set up. Um, and here in this building, you see in the house, the infill random rubble wall, you know, which provides an enclosure maybe for the animals at the bottom has collapsed. Uh, here is an interesting house with, uh, you know, uh, the modern sort of the in combination of the traditional system at the top and the modern RC still system at the bottom. And needless to say, see the interfaces of the modern and the traditional are always complicated. And what you see here is, you know, is the, is the problem at the interface, the timber and the RCC, you know, poor joinery has gone. And also you see uh, an RC column has, uh, you know, has under distress because, you know, I mean, <laughs> this is all Jugard RCC construction. So needless to say, even that's going to suffer. But see, basically the damage was, a lot of the damage was non-structural. And even the structural damage was also of low order. <coughs> Hence, the, it did not result in the collapse of traditional buildings. Now, let's see what happened to the, oh, sorry. <laughs> Still, yeah. Also, there are a lot of monasteries. And monasteries, Trees are typically masonry structures. You know, there may be some timber elements. So needless to say, you know, I mean, corner cracks developed. And maybe because of these big openings, you see the diagonal cracks have developed. You know, some places, of course, the damage was more. But see, these walls are pretty thick. And as a result, there were hardly any monastery had collapsed. And also, interestingly, here, so you see at the bottom, uh, they, have, they had this retaining wall. And which has collapsed. I mean, these things happen all the time, retaining walls collapsing in earthquake. And here is damage due to stone fall. No fault of the building, maybe wrong sighting. All right. So almost all the damage was restorable. Okay. What was really needed in this is to develop details. All right. To develop better interface of traditional versus in modern. See, this is where the engineer's role is there. All right. Now. Okay, finally, under the modern buildings, modern RCC buildings, what happened? Here is one example. This was quite close to the epicenter in a small hamlet of Chongtang. Some, it had some 50 or 80 houses and good majority was RCC, all right? So one of the things was happened was uh, the collapse of the infill walls. Uh, here is a school building. And it had a soft story. I guess it's a hall, right? So that collapse, very common, right? For, for stilted buildings. And here is a building of the Indo-Tibet Border Police, ITBB. This is an engineered building. The above two are definitely non-engineered buildings. But this one is an engineered building, all right? And look at the distress. And I'm sure they have demolished these buildings, all right? So. And the whole issue is, you know, which are Pakka and which are Kacha? You know, we are so strong on this Pakka and Kacha feel. You know, we feel that Pakka is permanent, Kacha is not permanent, Pakka is safe and Kacha is not safe. But what do, what would you ultimately deduct based on these buildings? And mind you one thing, all right? See, these buildings, like I said, the bottom two buildings are government buildings and the government is a lot of money, all right? So they can demolish them, they can bring a team to repair them and whatever. But what happens to the upper two buildings? Will this building owner have money even to demolish the building? All right. So this was a major dilemma here. The government had given five lakhs to each building owner and they said, all right, do what you want to do. So this is, I mean, when we get into this modern building system, which are complicated, we are getting into systems which are difficult to sustain. All right, I'll 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 come to that a little later. Now, let's, you know, I want to a little bit talk about this Pakka versus Kacha phenomenon. You know, because when we talk of the traditional buildings, we can't get away from this. All right. 
So it is important to understand why this mindset of Pakka versus Kacha is evolved. And this is primarily endemic to Indian subcontinent. All right. I mean, you go to other, other areas, you go to Turkey, you go to Central Asia, you go to China. I don't think anyone talks of Kacha and Pakka. I mean, see, like, I, I mean, I showed that those houses in the U.S., uh, million dollar houses back in 1983, you know, so the Ronald Reagan was the president of the United States. He had a mud house in Northern California, all right? So the Pakka versus Kacha is very much Indian, okay? And it's also important to understand how this whole phenomena is affecting housing in our country. Now, what is happening today? The modern is replacing vernacular. All right. Here is an example of a vernacular building. This could be anywhere in the country. In, all right. I mean, typically you have clay roofing tiles or timber or bamboo, and you have masonry or mud uh, walls. And against that, what is happening? You have this on the right side. This is a brick masonry infill with cement mortar and RC frame, a single story RC frame. This is a PMAY house, okay? This is the government flagship project, you know, very well meaning so that people have long lasting houses, all right? And unfortunately today, more than 90% houses which are being built under PMAY are of the RC frame type, right? So, I feel that PMAY is a death knell for the vernacular architecture. And then obviously people for people, this is one time opportunity in their life. You know, this is something they've wanted, they've been brainwashed, all right? So obviously they will go for this, but they don't know what they're getting into. So let's let's look at that now. And here is, here is the example of the same architecture in that area. Just beautiful. I mean, there's so much of variety and so much to do with the local context. All right. So let's let's look at this replacing. What is it doing? It's basically the village wealth, whatever that little there is, is flowing to the cities. All right. I mean, this is the Gandhian thought, whether we agree with that or not, but this is the ground reality. You know, the cement comes from the cities, the steel comes from the cities. And that's why the things are going. So the village wealth is getting drained and the villages become poor. Number two, money spent on these houses generates very few local jobs, All right? Because typically maybe 80% of the money invested is in material, all right? So what kind of local jobs? Ultimately, livelihood is the most fundamental thing for everyone, urban or rural. So creation of jobs and buildings are the biggest creator of jobs. <laughs> now, one more thing that's happening is the villages are becoming dependent on the materials coming from far. This means that some extraneous reasons increase the cost of these materials and people cannot afford these things anymore. Next point, villages are losing independence to take care of their most basic need. All right, something, you know, roti kapra makan. You want to be self-dependent. And the self-help possibilities are disappearing. Or even today in the villages, a lot of things people do themselves. You know, they make their own bricks in many areas. In Arunachal, when they make these bamboo houses, the whole village gets together. All right. And they, they build the house in four or five days. We are adopting technologies that are not in people's control. And what do I mean by people's control? We all know about the problems we have with waterproofing. We have these RCC roofs leaking like crazy and we can't do anything about that. We, I mean, you know, years ago we were in the south, uh, in, a, in, the, in, a, in a village in South Gujarat for three years and we lived in this Pakka house. All right. And we had an office which had a Mangalore tile roof. Our house had RCC roof. And in monsoon, our house leaked everywhere. You know, we had to decide which was the driest place where we could put all our valuable papers and 
other things and Mac. I had a computer back 30 years back, 40 years back, you know, Apple computer that time, you know, first of the Apples. And in the office where there were Mangalore tile room, wherever it started to leak, all you had to do was just adjust the tile a little bit to put a bit of packing and voila, the water stops coming. That is technology in people's control. All right. And of course, getting in house that is culturally inappropriate, climatically inappropriate. All right. I mean, recently we've been involved in a major intervention in Nepal. Okay. Or needless to say, same thing is happening there. All right. Because so wherever the cement and steel can go, wherever the bricks can go, you are seeing bricks instead of the local stones. All right. You are seeing, seeing RCC slab. But very interestingly, once people start living in them, they're complaining the houses are hot. What do you do now? All right. So I mean, in Uttarakhand, when we did work there, people were saying that our children are falling more sick in so-called pakka houses, you know, because they are cold in winter, they are damp in summer. So unlike your traditional houses, which are very well insulated, which are very, very waterproof, all right. And of course, we are losing identity and culture. Like in America, I mean, you bloody go from, you know, from New York to Los Angeles, it's all bloody the same thing. All right. So your cultural identity is this important. All right. Now, some more things. People switching over to modern building technology and materials because, all right, for Indian engineers, the ignorance about vernacular system prevents them from using it. I mentioned about this earlier. All right. Whether it is <coughs> private project or public project. I mean, I, I remember going to Arunachal. We were at a 13,000 foot pass. There was nothing around. And far away, I see a brick building, you know, where there is stone everywhere. And I wondered, I asked somebody local, what is that building? And I was told that, oh, that's a government building. So you are 200 kilometers from the plains where the bricks are made. All right. And you bring those bricks and you bring, you know, make the government building with that. So this is, this is what is happening. So establishment has switched over to modern building systems, even in the disaster, you know, even in the distant remote locations. All right. So you are setting an example for people to follow. All right. Hey, this is the way to go. This is modern. Aggressive advertising by material manufacturers is shaping people's aspiration, obviously. All right. I mean, you see, you know, Amitabh Bachchan selling <laughs> whatever, uh, you know, uh, whatever cement or steel or whatever obviously people people see these houses on tv they see them hoarding and obviously people will aspire for them and especially when when you know the traditional houses are called jhopri all right the problem is that when when a cement company is selling the advertising the cement it doesn't caution people about the problems in using cement all right the fundamental rules of cement okay so all this is at the risk of misguiding them and of course, there is peer pressure. We have seen poor people building a so-called pakka house. They borrow money and they get into debt. All right. And of course, today with all these new laws which are coming, which are a lot of them are anti-law, anti-people laws, the access to the local materials has, has been greatly constrained. All right. And this is again a hardship to people, which is forcing that to change over. You know, up in Uttarakhand, uh, people have, you know, this patal or stone roofs, which, which are supported on timber. And after maybe 25, 30 years, the timber starts to sag under the heavy load. And people know that they have to replace that timber. And if they don't replace it quickly, the roof is going to collapse. You know, we have seen houses with collapsed roof. The rest is intact. So what people are doing now, you know, people, people who have money, they remove their traditional roof, they remove the patal from the roof. You know, patal is laid in the front yard for flooring and they make RCC roof, all right, whether they like it or not, because they don't want the roof to collapse, all right. <clears throat> okay, uh, some more things. There's total neglect of vernacular system by engineering fraternity. 
All right. No advancement in vernacular construction to tackle age old irritants and new constraints. Sure, every building system has irritants, just like the modern systems. All right. And these irritants have to be tackled. So if there is a leakage problem, if there's a tree sagging problem, then we have to do something about it. Okay. If we don't, then people are sort of forced to abandon that. The mental blocks prevailing commonly that the buildings of traditional technology cannot have modern conveniences. I mentioned that earlier. Okay. So somebody who wants a modern bathroom will say that no, no, I cannot have a random rubble masonry house. I have to have a brick house. All right. But nothing could be farther from being wrong. Irritants and limitations of the modern construction systems are being accepted and underplayed. Isn't that true? Like I say, in our South Gujarat house that we had rented, bloody thing was leaking everywhere. And people say, well, you know, in rain, then they obviously leak. I mean, you know, what happens to our roads, Pakka roads? Because they are badly built, they have potholes. And then people say, oh, the monsoon was so strong. So they are potholes. We accept these things. You know, we don't say that, hey, these things have problems. All right. Vulnerability resulting from modern system is accepted and overlooked. What is the vulnerability? If reinforced concrete, we all know, we engineers know, that if it's not done as per the IS code, all right, your, your, your uh, course aggregates do not have the right gradation. If the sand doesn't have the right gradation, if the proportions are not right, if the water cement ratio is not right, what happens? Your slabs are not going to be waterproof. Your beams also will allow percolation. What happens then? Of course, your roofs leak. But more than that, the leakage, leakage is, of course, maybe temporary. All right. Uh, maybe only when it rains. But your reinforcement corrodes. And what happens? We all know what happens. All right. But we don't think of it. Because this is the only solution we know. So the whole question is, is the so-called Pakka construction system really safe and long-lasting? All right. For an engineer based on our education, a structure is either safe or unsafe, right? We all do this thing. WL squared by 8 divided by section modulus gives the stress. And the stress is less than allowable stress, then it's safe. If it's more, it's unsafe. Hey, redesign it. So it means everything is either black or white, nothing in between. But we all know hmm, that the reality is different. As they say in English, things are in thousand shades of gray. All right. Our buildings are neither absolutely safe or neither absolutely unsafe. They are they, they, they range everything in between. All right. The degree of safety varies from building to building, depending on how it built, who builds it. <clears throat> you know, since the building codes and rules of right constructions are violated routinely, what is done is most subjective. Right? I mean, one can have, you know, in seconds, I mean, the, the seismic zone four and five, we are supposed to use one is to four mortar for brick masonry. But what the hell? I mean, one can use one is to eight, one is to ten, one is to twelve, isn't it? I mean, that that's a reality that we see. So subjectivity. Hmm? One can put any steel anywhere. You see jugards everywhere. All right. So the limitations of modern technology in Indian contacts, you know, wrong practice means safety and durability is compromised. Modern RC-based systems comparatively are more complicated and less forgiving. I mean, we all know that one joint failing in an RC frame system can trigger failures of the next joints and next joints, and it can mean collapse of the whole structure. Vernacular systems that way are easier to build and more forgiving. Sure, I mean, if 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 in a random rubble masonry, if there is no interlocking of the wires, if there are no through stones, the wall is going to come down. But some mistakes here and there, it's not going to come down. We all know that. All right. So Pakka does not guarantee safety and permanence. We need to accept this. 
Vernacular is a greater likelihood to bring safety and longevity because they are easier to do. All right. Anyway, but things are not all that bad, I'll say, because I always am I'm used to looking at these silver lining to the dark clouds. Still a significant percentage of population has been continuing to use traditional systems even for new buildings for a variety of reasons. All right. Significant work has been done for improving traditional building systems in different parts of the country. I'll say, especially since mid 80s, a lot of work has been done. We have been involved, many other people have been involved. I think our next speakers have been involved for a few decades. A lot of people have been involved in different parts of the country. You know? So work has been done in Kashmir and in Uttarakhand and in Bihar and, and Karnataka and Kutch and everywhere, Maharashtra, all right? So training programs have been conducted for training. You know, today a big program is going on in Bihar to train the masons. All right. Um, so projects are being undertaken, have been undertaken to demonstrate in, in, in the technologies. <laughs> and typically, you know, post-disaster situation brings in a lot of money. All right. Which is oftentimes not there in normal times. So these are, provide opportunities for such work. You know, they provide opportunities for training. I mean, you know, back uh, after 2001 Kutch earthquake, uh, in, in three years, we, our group, trained about 8,000 masons. All right. So obviously, because there's a lot of money, there is a felt urgency at that point. So let us look at some examples of what kind of improvement has been done. Uh, first, I'll start, of course, with Latu, because, because we were there. You know, we were there for about six years, starting with the end of 93. We left Latur in 2000. But intensive work on technology got done in 94 to 98. Now, of course, we were absolute strong promoters of local systems. And hence, uh, you know, I mean, uh, some of these houses came up as demonstration. And also, we were able to convince some of the donors to take up programs. Now, very interestingly, you will see the right hand picture. There never were brick houses. And there in the post earthquake, people were so scared. So finally, they agreed you know, in this one particular village, or rather two or three villages where we work, they agreed that, OK, up to sill level, we'll have stone, random rubble. But above that, we'll have bricks. You know, their feeling was, well, if the stone falls in the head, then it can kill, kill them. But brick cannot. So we had to sort of compromise. <clears throat> so a variety of things happened. And the left hand picture is very much, you know, part of the traditional landscape, rural landscape, you know, very much merging into it. All right. Also, the poorer people there, you know, were building the mud block or adobe houses. And, you know, with our intervention, we also demonstrated to them that bamboo uh, can be used as reinforcement of, you know, as a band at different levels. So these kind of things are done, all right? Some more examples. In Latur also, I mean, uh, although something like uh, 30,000 houses had collapsed, I mean, there must be at least uh, a few lakh houses in that whole region. The whole Marathawada and adjacent Karnataka, adjacent Andhra, uh, where these kind of houses of random rubble masonry with heavy, you know, mud timber roof are there. And they're all of the same system and very, very vulnerable. So we're also taken of retrofitting, of improving the traditional building system so that it becomes safer. See, one major thing we have seen was that in the post-disaster, people lose confidence in their system. And need obviously, you know, because they will see, oh, that somewhere something what is called Pakka has survived. And I mean, in Killari, <laughs> in 93 October earthquake, only one house was RCC house, and it survived, all right? Because this was only a 6.4 magnitude earthquake, whereas you had these thousands of houses which are extremely vulnerable, and they had they were just waiting to collapse, okay? Because this was not a seismic zone, mind you. So obviously, when they see thousands of houses collapse and one RCC house standing, they all want that kind of house, and people are going to quickly run to those houses. So retrofitting is one way to rebuild their confidence, one way to prevent the demolition of these houses, you know, these wonderful houses that people are living in. 
All right. So simple measures were done, and uh, <coughs> we managed to work with 150 households and retrofit them using their money. All right. And this was basically done under with Professor Arya's guidance. All right. Later on in 2009 and 10 in Bihar, you know, this, this uh, uh, kind of a multiple of NGOs, uh, you know, I think they will be probably talking about this in the next presentation. But they did wonderful work on bamboo houses. Okay. Now, in that particular region of Bihar, bamboo is the most traditional and common building system along with bricks. And each village has a bamboo crop, which, which, you know, you can have fantastic bamboo right there. Now, the requirements of, of Bihar is that it is flood prone area. It also has high wind problems and, of course, seismic zone four. All right. So all three hazards are there. So the requirement number one was that there is water protection, that the, the house must not fall apart under flood. Old bamboo, improved bamboo system had excellent bamboo you know, or cement plaster which adhered well to the bamboo walls. Number two, it was also important <clears throat> that when the area remains flooded for more than a month, people are able to you know survive above the flood mark. So the, the basic, you know, the non-negotiable requirement was there should be a platform of for safety where people can live. At the height of 10 feet. All right, so that's third. Second, the third was the improvement in joinery. You know, the traditional joinery had problems, so remarkable work was done. You know, to improve the joinery, and you know, I mean, several hundred artisans were trained in this. And of course, as we know, bamboo has a preservation problem. Bamboo will rot very quickly, and so, very interestingly, the preservation system was brought in, and Special professional, local professionals were involved to do treatment of local bamboo. All right. So this is a complete system. See, in different countries, especially in the Southeast countries like Thailand, Taiwan, some and then, and of course, in Latin America, amazing work is getting done. And some absolutely fantastic bamboo structures are getting built. Okay. But along with that, preservation is an integral part of it. Without preservation, you can't be talking about these technologies because they don't last long. So why would anyone not want to build a bamboo house for all these disasters? All right. In Kashmir, after 2005 earthquake, we had opportunity to make a number of interventions starting with, you know, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008. You know, so one of the things we did, we spent nearly three months near the LOC. And what we worked on was the improved random rubble masonry in mud mortar house. So multiple bands were brought in. Now, the, traditionally, they used to have wooden bands in many houses. We had to bring in RCC bands because wood was not that easily available. All right. Um, you know, better anchoring of the floor and the roof with the wall, integral part of earthquake resistant construction. You know, I mean, we are known to build roofs just simply placed on top of the, the walls. So obviously the buildings fall apart. All right. Um, one of the things we did in these houses, you know, they had the Dadi Diwari. Most people know about Dadi Diwari in Srinagar, you know, which are timber lace, brick masonry walls. But there are also uh, timber lace stone masonry walls, you know, which is about six inches, six inches thick. And these are also fantastic walls. All right. And typically these are used Divided are not what you call partition walls. Okay, these are shear walls, these are load bearing walls. All right, so we studied the failures, and what was needed number one was better joinery. All right, also timber to timber joinery. Next thing was required was joinery between the dhaji wall and the exterior masonry walls, you know, because otherwise. Your masonry walls are going to be weak, being very long. We also introduced a band that will go on top of these Dhaji Diwari so that that band gets integrated with the band on the exterior walls. You know? And so all in all, we made major improvements in the Dhaji Diwari. You know, I think this is common sense engineering going into it. All right. And you need to be sitting there. Okay. So I and Rupal and our team of, you know, we are five of us. 
He spent three months near the near the LOC. We trained intensive training of 30 artisans in these buildings. And these fellows then later on built more than 300 houses for, for a major international foundation there. And this is a permanent thing which was left there with people. All right. The artisans are still there. They still communicate with us. All right. Coming to Bidrat earthquake in 2001. So large number of NGOs worked. And of course, a few of them were technically competent. We were part of that system. And we worked very closely with Gujarat State Disaster Management Authority. So like I say, you know, we during those four years, we trained over, uh, you know, something like 8,000 masons. And in this one particular program with Gujarat State Disaster Management Authority, you know, which we which was focused at some close to 500 villages, uh, about six and a half thousand masons were trained. So here is a, you know, multi-hazard resistant masonry house, which was built as per the official guidelines. It had multiple bands, needless to say, and it had simple fixtures to anchor the roof. Simple things were brought in. I mean, nothing hi-fi, common sense engineering, simple anchor bolt at the top of the gable wall so that ridge beam can be anchored. And of course, uh, in the roof, simple diaphragm was introduced using GI wires. And as you see, you know, you can see gable band and variety of things, but simple things were there. All right. Uh, also, you know, I mean, how would people know that this technology worked? Just because I go and tell them, you know, I mean, Latour was a was an interesting experience with us. Uh, Latour being so accessible, just like Kach, there were so many technological groups working there, and each one had an idea to sell. All right. I mean, sell is a bad word. But basically, these are all well-meaning. They were local people. But the whole question is, who, which is right, which is better? You know, why would someone trust what I'm saying? Okay. So one of the things we did was shock table test. Now, again, this is something we learned from Professor Arya. And he himself ought to have to also had to perform a shock table test to demonstrate how effective his retrofitting scheme for random roll buildings was. All right. Nobody in the government system, you know, there was something like 550 government engineers from chief engineer down to the junior engineer in the field who did not believe in what he was saying. So he had to ultimately demonstrate it. So he got a simple shock table like this built and, and he had tractor giving impact from both the ends and it was a fantastic demonstration. So we took it up from him. We took his design and in the engineering college in Latour, we built a platform and we carried out four tests. So one of the tests had uh, retrofitting in it, showing that retrofitting works. Secondly, we also demonstrated, you know, about against like what people are doing and what, what needs to be done. So what you see in the upper left hand picture, the right hand model is a brick masonry building with cement plaster on it. The way it is done by people, you know, in, 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 in cement mortar. But, but you know, typically people cure it for three days. All right. So that's what we did. We replicated what people did. And on the left side is a random rubble masonry building in mud mortar and with a uh, RCC band at the top. And I think there are these small, small corner strengthening elements. And, of course, the roof anchored to the wall. All right. So what you see is on the right side. What happened to the random rubble? It survived in, in mud mortar, whereas the house in cement mortar, with the way people built, it collapsed. You know, the message is that what you guys are doing is wrong. If you want to use cement mortar, you better cure it and you put, better put band in it. All right. Uh, this was our retrofitting test. All right. What we had done, we had a load bearing with a heavy roof and it survived 13 impacts from the tractor. All right. So, I mean, we could very clearly see, you know, how how the walls de delaminated and how they went out of plumb and how the whole thing ultimately came crashing down, all right? So these are, you know, major confidence building exercises, not only for engineers like us, but even, and of course, for the people and for the artisans, all right? So, I mean, the message is that desired safety can be achieved through right techniques. Now, let's, let's look at the hills. One of the problems in constructing in the hills, you know, to construct 
the disaster resistant houses hmm? today all right if you're going to use rcc bands even forget about rcc frame look at the left hand picture see what happens hmm? the house near the road is all right but rarely in the hills you have a site which is on the road something even that is fronting the road maybe 50 feet up or 50 feet down from the road so practically everything has to be carried and we had a site this is somewhat this is back in 2015 we were building a school building and just for the bands we had to take rods sorry and just see what you see on the left in picture the bars had to be bent and bent and bent until they are about 5 feet long which means that you go to the site and you have to straighten them out the cement was brought in from dehradun finally when it reached the site what we saw that number of bags the cement had had hardened we don't know what happened just in a period of 3 days this happened all right and there are villages which are like several days inside so think let's just think that you know what kind of complications you get into on the right hand side you see the sand being brought from the river bed to the site and of course in the middle you see the stones being brought from you know from far away you know i mean this is like in a ravine the stones are there brought to the site and they used in the bottom this is from nepal in the cgi sheets are being carried now fortunately here of course they had this earthen road but imagine walking around you know along a narrow trail which is barely 2 feet wide the sheets will bang everywhere hmm? all right so uh, these materials create major logistical hurdles especially the materials which are brought from far hmm? so here uh, in nepal what we did uh, we evolved a technology uh, back in 2015 uh, called the containment reinforcement this is a concept which was evolved by professor jagdish at institute of indian institute of science back in 2013 14 after latur earthquake in in our shock test also one of the shock tests we did was with with mud blocks when we did the first test he conducted on the containment reinforcement all right and then of course that concept has come a long ways and in 2015 we evolved with him with his guidance this uh, system and then this was submitted to the nepal government it was approved all right so this system basically has uh, as you see in the left hand picture the weld mesh bands is all done in mud mortar the, the, the you know the, the weld mesh straps are laid in the wall and mud mortar is placed on it and then the random rubble or brick can be placed on it and and you have wires Ah, uh, 4 mm GI wires on both faces of the walls, and you have this GI wire placed placed during the construction across what we call the cross links to anchor these uh, vertical wires. So here in the left hand picture, you can see these wires. You see a wire here. You see a wire here. So these are wires at about about three feet gap uh, vertically, and they're anchored to the wall at 16 inches. center to center vertically you know then they are on the both faces all right and that's why you are containing the wall containing the masonry <clears throat> so that's why this is called containment reinforce reinforcement all right so what you see on the right side is a two and a half story stone earth house with cr system see mind you uh, is 13727728 all these codes and uh, you know they don't permit mud mortar for more than a one and a half story but in the in the mountains in uttarakhand in himachal kashmir and in nepal the houses are always two and a half story okay the flat land is not available and they have to have space for the cattle they have space for storage you know so they have to have two and a half story houses and the code doesn't allow them and that's why the system was involved all right so to in for our own confidence for our own understanding shock table tests were performed now we back in 2005 we installed our our shock table that we had used in kutch this shock table we brought to nirmal university and was reinstalled there and 
In 2015, after Nepal earthquake, we conducted several tests there. So this, you know, we conducted first test on one and a half story house and then on two and a half story house. It's a half scale house. This is the biggest model we have ever tested. All right. And something like 14 shocks were given from you when know, we have this one and a half ton pendulum. With that, the shocks are given. And the, the structure survived very well with very little damage. All right. So, and in the 13th and the 14th shocks, the base acceleration was 2G. All right. In the upper right hand picture, you can see this pendulum has just hit the table. And you can see pretty much, you know, that the structure is, in, you know, intact, right? So with this data and the analysis carried out by Professor Jagdish, we prepared a package. This was done for UNDP Nepal, United Nations Development Program Nepal, with that support. So here is, oops, wait a minute. Why? Ah, why is my video not working here well i think i'll show the video separately then uh, okay there you go
हेलो सर सर वी आर नॉट गेटिंग ऑडियो फ्रॉम दी क्लू सॉरी ऑडियो ऑडियो इज नॉट क्लू फ्रॉम दी क्लू देर इज नो ऑडियो इन वीडियो क्लिप देर इज नो ऑडियो We can't listen to whatever uh, the video, uh, whatever we are, we are performing. Oh. Just we can see the video, but uh, the audio is not popping. Yeah, yeah, no, no. All right. <laughs> I don't know why the audio didn't come. But anyway, this is what you see. This is a schematic. This is something that was submitted to the Nepal government, and. Uh, uh, So this was approved by the Nepal government in 2017. It was a long time. I don't know why. What is that? Hello. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, and more than three hundred houses houses have been built, and several hundred artisans have been trained. So this is an excellent example of synthesis of the traditional with the modern science and material. Okay. One last issue I want to cover here is that you know this whole mindset that modern conveniences cannot be Part of the traditional system. So here is, you know, in the right upper pictures, you can see that was an excellent example of Uttarakhandi random rubble house, where it had a cement floor and it had the standing platform like modern house. Uh, so everything that people were demanding. On the left side, you see this is our mud house in Dehradun uh, outskirts near Masuri, and this is like you know, this is a one and a half foot thick mud walls, and we also made a modern kitchen in it. All right. so all the modern conveniences can be there all right uh, just one other factor i want to mention here is the energy consumption in the construction construction because all the materials which we use you know which have the special properties i mean these properties have been created by the consumption of this energy a typical brick uses 850 kilo calories and cement uses uh, 3750 kilo calories per kg And steel, eighty-five hundred kilo calories. You know, so typically, uh, every house consumes a lot of calories, and this means it has carbon footprint. On the other hand, in the vernacular building system, it has very little embodied energy, if any, and as a result, it emits very little poison in air. You know, so also one of the great thing about these traditional systems is that it allows recycling. You know, because I mean, recycling means very small carbon footprint and requires no long distance transportation that consumes energy and that pollutes air, and it's suitable for local climatic condition. You know, I basically covered all these points earlier. So, this is the most green and sustainable option. All right. I mean, today, you know, with all this Western influence, we are talking about green architecture and all that, but we have these wonderful examples in our backyard. All right. Uh, so this this really, the, if we continue using vernacular systems, they will contribute significantly towards reducing the impact of climate change. And the you know this, I mean, to me, this is the greatest disaster: the climate change, not earthquake, not cyclone. They come and go, but this thing is going to be there, and this is going to create changes which are which are very very scary. And we have to be scared, all right? Then only we'll do something about it. Now, these kind of buildings account even today for 75% of houses and infrastructure building in small towns and rural areas. You know, so they form a most important segment of construction activity. So, you know, if this, if these things are vernacular systems are continued on large scale, I think they will, they will help us tackle the climate change and global warming. Now. Here I want to just bring one interesting example of a house we built 30 years ago. All right, this is built about 30 kilometers from uh, Ahmedabad, and it's a mud wall house. Now, number of technologies were used. Number one, we had these cladding tiles. You know, so on this mud blocks, we we attach the cladding tiles. A very simple mechanism to make the walls uh, not only rain rain resistant. But also, uh, you know, it is snake and mouse resistant. They can't burrow in the mud wall. Number two, you know, you can see we have this timber beam with wire reinforcement. So simple trusses were made 
so that smaller diameter timber could be used. And ultimately, timber is also scarce material. And we need to conserve it. Uh, here was as the precast column we had made because this is something that goes in the ground and it rots very fastly. Achha, one more thing I want to mention here that we are very proud of. The timber you see in the roof is all tertiary timber, basically eucalyptus. Imagine 1990, we built the house and still it survives. All that timber, which typically would have, would have deteriorated completely in five years because we carried out a hot and cold treatment on site that timber has still survived, all right? So today, I mean, timber should be used and can be used, but with preservation. And this is the most versatile material and it should be promoted, all right? Yeah, another thing is because to conserve timber, we eliminate the frames. And here is what you call a frameless door. Old pivots, you know, which were used, they're very effective. You know, there is a there is a system with which you can attach the pivot in the wall. So that is a pivot, you know, hinge, I mean, frameless door and a frameless window on the right side, the vertical pivot. So all these things are possible. All right. So here is the house back in 1990. And here is a house, the same house after 30 years. All right. Now, interestingly, you know, the PMAY's main requirement is the house should be 30 years and a house should last for 30 years. So my question is, can this house qualify for PMAY? All right. All right. Uh, all right. I think, you know, we have talked about this. The vernacular systems are very versatile. They can be modified to change the context. You know, they can be made disaster resistant in an affordable manner. What is required is to do research and infill trials, all right? to remove the age-old irritants. I mean, today, typically, people don't want to use clay tile roof because they say, oh, the monkeys break them, all right? So what can we do about that? Why can't the IITs and NITs do research on that? You know, the timber preservation. Why can't they be, you know, why can't that be made mainstream? Why can't every village treat the timber, all right? A lot of simple things. So what is required is to do synthesis of the modern science and technology with the traditional systems, okay? And to build people's confidence in that, all right? And we need to bring in respect, respectability. And I think it's the education system that should do that, all right? So I think this is all. We need to think safe. We need to think green. We need to improve vernacular. I think that's the way to go. And hence, we need to educate our engineering students about the vernacular systems and bring respectability in their mind, and hence in everybody else's mind. Thank you very much. All right, I think I've ended my presentation. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. It was really, really informative for all of us. Uh, I would like to ask attendees if anyone has any kind of doubt, they can ask, sir, now, related to the session, related to the topic, anything. Yes, please. If I have any kind of doubt, they can ask by unmuting their mic or else they can write in the chat box. Uh, sir, there is a question in the chat box. Uh, Mr. Bhushan, sir, has asked that wood construction in flood-prone areas is not done. Bricks are weak in shear, so reinforced masonry is used but costly for more than three stories. Tolu construction in China is good but issues with the size in execution. Bamboo construction quality and quantity is an issue for mass housing. Japan has excellent joint connection in timber. So he is asking how to bring vernacular construction for masses. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> that's a 
That's a very big question. Um, I mean, a lot of things may be happening in China and Japan. All right. I think what is required is to do what is feasible here. What is it that artisans can do? And I mean, again, when you say mass housing, mass housing in urban and mass housing in rural are entirely two different games. All right. So mass housing in rural, you have to empower rural. Rural people build their own houses. No one else has to build for them. Okay. So while we are talking about vernacular systems, I'll say essentially that as far as the rural areas are concerned, what is required is to, to improve their technologies, to make sure that the materials they're able to access, you know, so that, you know, decentralized treatment preservation plants are made, simple plants. And in Bihar, if they could have that bicycle mounted bamboo preservation system, you know, these are very, very viable system. So we really need to things which are viable, which are replicable. All right. Urban thing is a completely different thing. The context is different where you have this high intensity population and where you may have to, you know, you will definitely have to go about about three story. And so, the, you know, the, the context is very, very different and technologies will be different. And today, you know, today there is a lot of talk about emerging technologies. But, you know, although I'm not involved in that, I know some people who are. And there are serious reservations that many of them have mentioned, because especially the kind of investments that a lot of these emerging technologies require are huge. And as a result, you know, bringing in these technologies and, and, and you know, put them in the mainstream and all that, you know, may require a long gestation period and a lot of investments. So, so you know, those those things look great when they're demonstrated, but I think to bring in for masses and on large scale, I think the hurdles are immense. Uh, hopefully the doubt is being cleared. You are, uh, you are allowed to you... unmute your mic yourself. So you can ask uh, by unmuting your mic. Uh, sir, uh, good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, sir, uh, as the, the, this today's session was really uh, so wonderful, and uh, things which has been uh, discussed here, I have already seen this in Arunachal and I am from this uh, hilly area of Uttarakhand. We have this uh, two and a half story house uh, with the traditionally uh, built constructions. And also I have been there in the, I had of lay. So I have seen uh, such type of works and also executed that bamboo thatch houses. But sir, main reason of uh, that uh, bamboo uh, this split bamboo house is uh, that security, that uh, privacy and security is there, sir. Again, sir, uh, may I know what is the phenomena of this two and a half story build, uh, buildings, which we have, but we are not aware of what is the logic band, what our ancestor had, uh, the reason behind this uh, construction two, two and a half stories building, sir. Thank you, sir. No, no, I mean, I, I think your question is, is not very clear, but I mean, as far as in the hills, uh, yes. when, I, when we are talking about two and a half story, typically, it's, you know, I've seen in Uttarakhand where the ground story is 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 used for cattle, and yes. part of it will be kitchen. Upper story is your living quarter, and then you know you have the upper half story, which a lot of times people use to store things. Okay, right. Main main issue here is that. You know, I mean, the, the the flat land is not there. And the only way people can have adequate space is by building two and a half stories or three stories if they can. You know, there are places where, they, you know, like, like this Koti Banala, it actually I've seen, it's a six-story structure, but that kind of thing is not replicable. But I personally feel that, like, say, even this containment reinforcement system that, that we have worked on and that Professor Jagdish has designed, you know, the results are very encouraging and further research can be done to make it maybe even three and a half story. All right. 
So ultimately, see to me, any technology, I mean, our experience, we started with this uh, containment reinforcement system in Uttarakhand back in 2014 after the Kedarna tragedy. And it gave us a lot of confidence because the Masons learned that technology very fast. And then we took it to Nepal. And what we find is that even if the house is, you know, I mean, one day march from the road, carrying in that wire bundles and carrying in the straps of weld mesh and all that is a is lot, lot easier. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's a lot easier than carrying in, in, in reinforcement and cement and sand and, and, and aggregates and all that. You know, so logistically, it made things very, very easy. Uh, and, you know, back in 2014, after Kedana tragedy in Uttarakhand, <coughs> there was... You know, there was this World Bank funded rehabilitation program where three and a half thousand houses were built. Now, I was I was there as a consultant. And what we found out, because the government wanted that even if somebody uses random rubble masonry, cement mortar must be used. All right. You know, this is our, our, our engineer's mindset. And they insisted that it should have RCC bands. All right. So as a result, what problem they had was that in the, in the remote houses, you know, carrying in aggregates and sand, I mean, getting that from the river valley and all that was prohibitively expensive and time consuming. So this is where, you know, containment, you know, containment reinforcement is one example. That is not the only example. And this is where research is required. So that simpler technologies are, are brought to people and they're easy to adopt. And, you know, what we find is that, you know, I mean, <laughs> the first house we built in 2016 and the mason so quickly picked up and he created his own jugaad to, to do it faster. All right. So what I'll ultimately say is that in the hills, if, if people can build three and a half story houses, then that would be even better, you know, because, and I'll, I'll tell you, after after Chamoli earthquake, because when the houses are not well made, typically the upper story suffers more damage because of greater shaking. And what happened in Chamoli earthquake was a large number of houses, the upper story was cracked. And as a result, a lot of people dismantled that upper story. Now, <laughs> you know, so several years later, I'm sure probably they went back and built the upper story because they had no land to live in. Okay. So, I mean, I hope I've answered your question. Thank you, sir. All right. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, so there is uh, there are also two questions in chat box. Uh, Mr. Mohit Kumar has asked, what has to be the composition of mud mortar? Okay. See, I mean, <laughs> you know, mud mortar typically should not be extremely clay. Okay. I mean, it should not have more than about 15% of clay. Okay. Because so... In, in areas which are predominantly clay soil, they end up adding, uh, you know, granular soil like sand because highly clay soil will crack and they will shrink. So ideally, you know, your, 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 your mortar would be what I would call, I would call a clay sand and not a sandy clay. And Typically, in every area, people know which is good soil for water. All right. So, a lot of times we feel that you know when we go out as so-called experts and and we try to teach them, we have, you know we find we have to be very careful. So I you know we we leave it to them. I mean, what we do in our intervention is that if they are making some major mistakes, then we try to intervene. All right, because like when we are working with random rubble, we know that they are breaking major rules of how to place a stone and you know how to fill the voids and things like that. So when it comes to mud mortar, mud plaster, local people know which are the local sources of soil, you know, which are most suitable for that, that particular application.
Thank you, sir. Sir, sure. there is another question. Uh, Ms. Uh, Professor Radia has asked to please tell about strain testing for vernacular structure or adobe brick. What testing? Uh, he has asked to tell about strain testing. Strain. Strain <coughs> testing vernacular <coughs> or adobe brick. All right. <laughs> See, this is, I mean, uh, one does string testing and thing like that when you are really getting into hardcore research, all right? Because the testing we have done, uh, you know, has been done in the field, and typically, the the field testing you do to 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 observe the most common type of damage is right. So, so in just... case of seismic condition. Okay. In, uh, when you have out of plane forces or when you have in plane forces, okay. what is the kind of damage you have? And based on that, the, you know, the testing is done. So all the testing we have done, you know, we have used accelerometers to find out what kind of acceleration is getting generated. Answer this kind of testing, we don't get into the strain testing. No, those are typically you know, maybe on, you know, uh, the Mason D pedestals. So, you know, that's very much academic and, you know, we are, we have been working very much on, on the practical side in the field. Uh, thank you, sir. So, that is another question by Professor Poonam Modi, ma'am. Uh, she is asking, what is your vision about the vernacular structures in Gujarat five years down the line? What is the last word? What is your vision about the vernacular structures in Gujarat five years down the line? In the years down the line? Yes, <clears throat> I do. See, I mean, I, I mean, I personally feel that there should be number one masonry structures. I think there should be as little of cement and steel as possible. We all know <laughs> that you know, the cement and steel means dilution. So, see, when it comes to government structures, it is panchayat, house, school, you know, they are of higher specification. But even there, I'll say that masonry structures should be promoted because they set examples for the people to follow. Now, obviously, you know, I mean, school or panchayat building, and uh, you know, these are what we call the infrastructure buildings. They will have a higher specification, <laughs> but when it comes to houses, you know, people can use lower specification, but even there, people should know what they need to do. See, today, what we are finding, you know, we have been involved in building artisan training for the last 25 years, and we have an ongoing program for the last 15 years, and we have, you know, we have trained so far something like about 15,000 masons and, and bar benders and so on and so forth. The problem arises in the rural areas that, number one, they don't know the rules. Number two, even if they know the rules, people don't allow them to do that. Mind you, see, people, house owners also have their own ideas about what is right, what is wrong. You know, and of course, they are not informed well. So when, when we have technologies which are simple, you know, it's easier to educate people about them. And, and so I, my, my feeling is that in, in terms of vernacular, you know, vernacular is something that is constantly changing, all right? It's not something fixed. I mean, there was something that 200 years ago, maybe 100 years ago, things changed a little bit. 50 years ago, they changed a little bit more. Now they've changed. What I feel is that, you know, because since we all are instrumental, you and I and all of us <clears throat> are instrumental in bringing those changes, you know, our vision should be that whatever happens, it should be people friendly and it should be something that people are able to manage, people are able to afford. You know, when I say manage, people are able to maintain them. You know, so all these issues have to be there. And I personally feel that there should be as little use of cement and steel as possible. I'm not saying that don't use them, but use them little. You know, so bands, yes, they should be there. All right. But for roofs, I still feel that at least the top roof would be best be Mangalore tile roof because it's so easy to make it waterproof. Now, against monkeys, well, this is where I think 
our research departments have to do something about this so they don't get damaged they are able to withstand the impact you know so and 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 really in arid areas i think the mud roofs i mean mud mud houses should be promoted you know they should be made respectable and i think there has to be something connect something i mean the carbon footprint should be connected to the houses all right because if we don't then we are facing problems uh, hopefully uh, everyone's doubts have been have been cleared uh, do anyone have any more doubts they can ask by unmuting their mic <laughs> Okay, uh, I guess uh, all doubts are clear. Thank you, sir. Thank you for sparing your valuable time with to us, and thank you for sharing this immense knowledge of yours and this vast experience with all of us. Thank you so much. It's it really means a lot for all of us. Thank you, sir. Uh, all the participants are yes, sir. No, it's been my pleasure. <laughs>